My name is Yuri Tunchuk. I'm a PhD student from University of Bern, from SCG. And today I want to talk about you, to talk with you, about our experience of integrating quality assistant into FARA, what, what it caused. So first of all, the, the main concept is simple. You have a quality rule, which checks code, and then it produces some critique. And then this critic, if it's, if it's really good, if it helps you to improve the code, okay? But sometimes it's not good because the rule is, is not exact enough or something like that. But then this critique can be used to improve the rule if you have a feedback about the critique. And then when you have the feedback, the rule can be improved, there is a second version which, which produces a better critique and then it's useful. The problem starts when you don't have this feedback. Because you, then you are not improving rules and then the bad critiques are just stuck there and then users are not using the, uh, the, the static analysis tools. So what we did, there was a critique browser for a long time in Faro, which was integrated. But apparently people were not using it too much. Um, and then we integrated Quality Assistant, which is this uh, small piece at the bottom, which gives you live feedback about critiques. So we kind of enforced people to use the static analysis, and we carefully listened to feedback. And what happened is that, well, you know that if you want to make some changes in Faro, you open an issue entry on Bug Tracker. So we checked the number of issues for small int, and for FARO 5, the number of issues was the same as for FARO 4 and FARO 3 together. And for FARO 6, it's still low because like FARO 6 is just started, it's in development. So what were these issues about? They were a lot about changes in the rules. And there were three kinds of changes. Either some rules were fixed, <coughs> or rules were removed from the system completely or new rules were added um, and I want to cover each of these cases so when rules were fixed um, for example there is a rule which checks okay what is a protocol of add method in collection well it's adding and what is a protocol of the add method in array collection which is a subclass it's also adding which is good but if you have a mismatch, like in collection it's accessing, it tells you that there is a problem. Okay, because it's kind of strange that there is the same method and then it's in a different protocol. But there was an error because when the protocol was not defined, imagine you are subclassing from some node that is library and the protocol is not defined, and you define a protocol and it still says that it's a problem. So what does it mean? You have to make your method in undefined protocol or what? So, it is a trivial bug, right? Someone didn't check all the use cases and it was there. But there were other cases. For example, there was a rule which was checking if you are modifying a collection inside of an iteration block on that collection. And after a quality system was integrated, there was the showstopper bug entry because apparently when this rule is checking methods, it's tearing apart their ASDs. Why not? And it was really bad because you were working on the methods, quality system was always checking them and it was destroying your ASDs and then you had exceptions. And I would say that this is a horrible bug. But think about that, the rule is not new. So it was used also in critique browser, and when you run critique browser on a huge piece of code, it also destroys, destroys a lot of ASTs, but it was not noticed. So you may guess how much critique browser was used. Um, also, some rules were removed, and there were three rules like that. And first of them was saying probably you are missing semicolon yourself. And this was annoying people, because in fact you can have a legit code with cascades where you don't have yourself in the end, so it was removed. Another rule was saying that you have to have blocks in special messages, like if you have if true or false, they have to have blocks. And there are cases where this works completely fine, and this is like 
old Oro code which yes. works like that and you don't have to unwrap the blocks and so on. And it was also removed because people said that, okay, all normal developers know how this thing works, so we don't have to bother them with this. And another rule was saying that we are re referencing an abstract class. So, for example, when you have string new, string is an abstract class, it has abstract methods, this was reported. And all the other classes were reported, and we just said, okay, it's use useless. So, um, I would say that all the removed rules were educational. Because if you think about new guy entering forum, uh, he doesn't know about the cascades that it returns the last value, so maybe you should tell him about yourself, and maybe he forgets about blocks, and maybe you should warn him when he has an abstract class, like a number, and he creates a new instance. Um, but we removed them because apparently most of people didn't like that. And then there were rules which were added. And then there was one good thing which I really liked, because we got rules in separate packages. So instead of throwing everything into one package with rules, like rules about small int, no, not about small int, rules about uh, SUnit were in the package of SUnit. So if in some case you want to unload SUnit and use the super cool new framework, you just remove the rules about SUnit from your image. But in details about the rules, there were rules which were just saying, okay, instead of if not nil do, use if not nil. Instead of smalltalk add, use smalltalk globals add. Instead of assert and then the expression of equality, use assert equals message. And I would say that these are migration rules, and the way to do them are <coughs> rewrite rules. Okay, so you can just say, okay, I have this pattern, I want to have that, it's super easy. Another kind of added rules, we're saying, okay, you are accessing boxed flow 64, and you shouldn't do that because it's a system concept that relies on VM, and it's there because of that. You should use flow. And well, I would say that this is a private access rule because you should be able to somehow annotate your entities that, okay, pay attention, this thing is there because of special reasons. Maybe you should not rely on that. And, well, the recipe to handle that is to have some annotation weight. For example, in Faro, we have an agreement that if it's in a private protocol, it should be handled with care. Also, you can have a list of all the system classes and check if the accessed classes in the list. Um, another kind of added rules. So, if you look at this code, it's a Rosal code. And apparently, if you define edges, before you specify nodes, it will not work. Okay, this is how Rosal is designed. First you put nodes into your builder and then you say how the edges should be drawn. And I would say that this is in location order rules and we had the special cases about that. For example, in the rubric you also have to set up model before saying how you highlight stuff and so on. And I made just a new super type of rules which allows you to say, okay, Add a new specification that edges requires pre-send nodes. And it just checks the code if edges appears. Or sometimes there is also post-send. So you define something that should be followed by another message. And you can check the sequence like that. Um, yet another type of rules. So for example, in my rule model, you need to override one of the methods to return true. So you know that actually the rule itself checks this entity, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Or sometimes you have cases where you need to override some method in a subclass, because it's a requirement, it's a model like that. And I would say that this is a class structure rule, because it defines like, okay, how you should assemble your classes. And the, the recipe for this is essentially just take the bare uh, objects and uh, work through that. So in this case I was just checking if the class that I have, it is a subclass of, of, of a rule type, and then uh, I was checking if any of the selectors returns true. Otherwise you can also check, okay, if this method is in that class, and if it has an override or supersend. 
And then the last type of rules is also kind of interesting, and it's I would say it's the most complicated one. Because it comes from a glamorous toolkit. And if you look at this code, it has these methods initialization at the beginning. And this is bad. Because when the, the views are constructed, then this thing is run all the time. So the way to do it is to put it inside of the display part, but this is also bad because this is an expression which will be evaluated. But if you wrap it in a block, then it will be evaluated only on display, not when you create the presentation object, but when you select the presentation and it renders the stuff. And, well, I call this lazy evaluation rules because the only use case was in a glamorous toolkit, but it would be nice to see if there are other rules that are similar but a bit different. And for that we were just working with bare AST. So we had a special helper methods that were checking if like a presentation which is passed is leftmost and then we had like okay, we have a statement and then we check if statement is a cascade or is a message because we have here uh, we have here one statement, right? And then we check if the leftmost chain receiver is a presentation which is composite here, then we move forward. As we have some some hacks there, but it would be nice to know what are the other rules that need this stuff. And in the end, a bit about feedback. So there is a possibility to give positive or negative feedback about critiques in our tool. And it can be viewed on this website. And if you look at it, you can see that on the top of negative uh, feedback, close to the top, there are rules that were already removed. So we actually reacted to that. On the top of, well, closer to the top of positive feedback, there are some rules that were just recently added, like this assert equals rule, which is also good because we created a new rule which is helpful for people. This thing is not really accurate, because if you look at that, on both tops there are same things, right? Uncommented class, or method without the protocol, right? <laughs> but, well, developers are are giving feedback. So we have to take into account developers. To wrap up, um, we integrated quality system and we forced people to use it and we tried to take into account their feedback. What happened, the rules that were bad were fixed, which is good. They were there broken for a long time. When we integrated quality system, people saw that they are bad, they reported it, we fixed that. Some rules were removed which were, in my opinion, educational rules. And maybe we should take this into account. So maybe in new images for teaching or things like that, we should have them. And then, quite a lot of rules were added. And we tried to categorize them as migration rules that specify that instead of this, you should use that, and they are easy to implement. There are private access rules that we don't have a complete idea how to define, but we are still able to do that. We need to more use cases. There are invocation order rules, which are already there for uh, Rubri, for Rosal, and we just need to see if people like them or not. Uh, there are also class structure rules, which are there and which are easy to define using pair objects. And there are these uh, lazy evaluation rules which we were able to create, but it would be nice to see more use cases so we can come up with some kind of framework. But this is it for now. This is our experience and thank you for listening. So it will be really good if you could run on the ring uh, model, for example. Um, it's not uh, working all the time. So, well, if anyone is interested in doing that, I would really like to, to put more effort into it. But we have to define like, okay, what, what are the goals and so on. 
because for now we were running it only in the image to give a lot of feedback and we were relying on compiled methods and on behavior instances. Yeah. So on the idea of educational rules, yes. um, have you talked about like I don't know like profiling the learner? For example, I will use a lot of these educational rules. And it would be nice to have it and, and use when you are becoming more expert, you disable them. So we will some kind of talk about this. Yes, it's also a nice idea. So we have collected, when people allowed us anonymized data, which rules do they use or not. And it would be interesting to see if we can define some, some things that we should show to people and should not. But for now, we just have data. We have not looked at it. But it's definitely the way to do it. We don't want to make guy click like I don't like this and so on. Maybe he ignores it all the time. Just yeah, or how it just at the beginning. I mean, you can have like something that you can disable uh, yes. the more expert you become. Yeah. Okay, last question. You raised it. Uh, struck me that um, in the lazy valuation thing, um, yes. that arguably is a piece of code that should have been in the framework to raise an error when the programmer used it. And so uh, it strikes me that you could uh, automate the moving of, 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 of assertion checking code from the, the domain code itself to quality assistant as an optimization 